Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, October the 12th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way, kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from evil every way, in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 12. At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But the Pharisees saw it, they said to them, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. He said to them, Which of one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy, like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 7, on Repentance, beginning in paragraph 39. Furthermore, the power of the keys administers and presents the gospel through absolution, which is the true voice of the gospel. We also include absolution when we speak of faith, because faith comes from hearing. Excuse me. Ugh, terrible. Mm. Because faith comes from hearing, as Paul says in Romans 10.17. When the gospel is heard and the absolution is heard, the conscience is encouraged and receives comfort. Because God truly brings a person to life through the word, the keys truly forgive sins before God. According to Luke 10.16, the one who hears you hears me. Therefore, the voice of the one absolving must be believed no differently than we would believe a voice from heaven. 
absolution can properly be called a sacrament of repentance, as even the more learned scholastic theologians say. Meanwhile, in temptations, this faith is nourished in a variety of ways through the declarations of the gospel and the use of the sacraments. For these are signs of the New Testament, that is, signs of the forgiveness of sins. They offer the forgiveness of sins as the words of the Lord's Supper clearly testify, this is my body which is given for you, this is the cup of the New Testament, and so on. See Matthew 26, 26, and 28. So faith is conceived and strengthened through absolution, through the hearing of the gospel, through the use of the sacraments, so that it may not give in to the terrors of sin and death while it struggles. This method of repentance is plain and clear. It increases the worth of the power of the keys and of the sacraments. It illumines Christ's benefit and teaches us to make use of Christ as mediator and the atoning sacrifice. Because the confrontation, excuse me again, it's terrible, isn't it? Sorry. Because the confutation condemns us for having assigned these two parts to repentance, we must show that Scripture expresses these as the chief parts in repentance or conversion. Christ says, Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Here there are two parts. The labor and the burden signify the contrition, anxiety, and terrors of sin and death. To come to Christ is to believe that sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. When we believe, our hearts are brought to life by the Holy Spirit through Christ's word. Here, therefore, are these two chief parts, contrition and faith. In Mark 1.15, Christ says, Repent and believe in the gospel. In the first clause, he convicts of sins, and in the second, he comforts us and shows us the forgiveness of sins. Believing the gospel is not the general faith that devils also have, but in the proper sense, it is believing that the forgiveness of sins has been granted for Christ's sake. This is revealed in the gospel. You see also here that the two parts are joined, contrition, when sins are rebuked, and faith, when it is said, believe in the gospel. If anyone should say here that Christ also includes the fruit of repentance or the entire new life, we shall not disagree, for this satisfies us that contrition and faith are named as the chief parts. When Paul describes conversion or renewal, he almost everywhere designates these two parts, making dead and making alive. I said, Colossians it's two eleven. I am really sorry. <laughs> I can't stop yawning today. When Paul describes conversion or renewal, he almost everywhere designates these two parts, making dead and making alive, as in Colossians 2.11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, namely by putting off the body of the flesh, and afterward in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. Colossians 2.12. Here there are two parts. One is putting off the body of sins. The other is the rising again through faith. Neither should these terms making dead, making alive, putting off the body of sins, rising again, be understood in a platonic way about a fake change. Rather, making dead means true terrors, such as those of the dying which nature could not sustain unless it were supported by faith. Paul calls that the putting off of the body of sins, which we ordinarily call contrition. In these griefs, the natural, lustful desire is purged away. The making alive should not be understood as a platonic fancy, but as comfort that truly sustains life, that flickers in contrition. Here, therefore, are two parts, contrition and faith. For conscience cannot be quieted except through faith. Therefore, faith alone makes alive, according to this declaration, the righteous shall live by his faith. Habakkuk 12.4, Romans 1.17. Colossians 2.14 says, Christ canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Here also there are two parts, the handwriting and the blotting out of the handwriting. The handwriting, however, is conscience convicting and condemning us. The law, furthermore, is the word that rebukes and condemns sins. Therefore, this voice that says, I have sinned against the Lord, as David says, 2 Samuel 12.13, is the handwriting. Wicked and secure people do not seriously give forth this voice, for they do not see. They do not read the sentence of the law written in the heart. This sentence is perceived in true griefs and terrors. Therefore, the handwriting that condemns us is contrition itself. To blot out the handwriting is to chisel away the sentence by which we declare that we shall be condemned, and to engrave the sentence by which we know 
that we have been freed from this condemnation. Faith is the new sentence. It reverses the former sentence and gives peace and life to the heart. What need is there to cite many testimonies, since they are everywhere clear in the scriptures? The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Psalm 118.18 My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Psalm 119.28 Here, contrition is contained in the first clause, and how we are revived in contrition is clearly described in the second. We are revived by God's word, which offers grace. This sustains and enlivens hearts. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. 1 Samuel 2.6 Contrition is meant by one of these. Faith is meant by the other. The Lord will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed. And to work his work, alien is his work. Isaiah 28.21 He calls it the strange work of the Lord when he terrifies, because to make alive and comfort is God's own proper work. But he terrifies, Isaiah says, for this reason, that there may be a place for comfort and making alive. For hearts that are secure and do not feel God's wrath hate consolation. In this manner, Scripture is accustomed to join these two, the terrors and the consolation. It does this to teach that there are these chief parts in repentance, contrition and faith that comforts and justifies. Neither do we see how the nature of repentance can be presented more clearly and simply. And we'll continue again tomorrow evening. Now we join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers, bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian Church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church and the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in the right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women according to your mercy a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Lord of the Sabbath, you gave your servant David the bread of the presence on the Sabbath to teach him that you desire mercy and not sacrifice. Be merciful to us by healing us from all our sins and diseases, that we may be merciful to others as you have been merciful to us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, 
and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.